and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today is the third in a series of videos where I look at the history of our understanding of the atom. And if you've watched my previous videos, you'll know that I've already discussed Rutherford and his gold foil experiment which helped us understand the planetary model of the atom. Namely, we have a key nucleus in the center where all the mass predominantly is uh, located and the electrons are spinning around. But of course that has a problem because those electrons would be accelerating and therefore releasing energy and the electrons should be spiraling in. Well, Niels Bohr was a was a Danish scientist who came up with a modification of that model and then was able to use that model to also explain Barmer's work on spectral lines. And if you remember my video on Barmer and spectral lines, is that Barmer was able to establish a mathematical relationship between the various absorption lines for hydrogen. Barmer, of course, wasn't able to explain it. But as we come to see, Niels Bohr is able to explain that. So let's get started. Well, Bohr basically came up with some key postulates, and we're going to examine them one by one. The first thing that Bohr postulated is that the electrons orbit around the nucleus in a circular orbit under the influence of Coulomb's attraction to the nucleus. So in that regard, we are no different to what Rutherford already stated. He was consistent with Rutherford's view that the nucleus was in the center, the, most of the mass was there, and that the electrons were in orbit around that nucleus. The second postulate is really critical. And if you look at your history of physics, you know that in 1900 and 1905, we have the introduction of quantum thinking, initially with Max Planck's work on black body radiation, and of course, Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect. And Bohr took that on board. So he came up with the postulate is that electron here has angular momentum, which is L. And he's saying it is quantized. That is, the amount of angular momentum it has is a set value. And so therefore, only discrete orbits are allowed. And this formula was the formula on angular momentum. So n was simply a number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 integers for each of the levels here that we have. h is Planck's constant, which we are hopefully familiar with, and 2 pi of course, is just a constant. So basically what he's saying is, is that this electron can exist in this orbit, this electron can exist in this orbit, but it is impossible for the electron to exist anywhere in between. So it was a quantized value or discrete. Tied to that is that if those electrons are in an orbit, in this case, in that particular orbit, as long as it stays in that orbit, it actually does not radiate any energy. In other words, there is no gain of energy, there's no loss of energy. If the electrons was in this orbit, it also would be stable. And so that's the third postulate. That is, the electrons, as long as they're in one orbit, will not radiate any energy. Now this is the critical one. Basically Bohr said, okay, how can an electron go to another orbit? Well, the first thing that they could do is they could be radiating. So they go from a larger to a smaller. So if, for example, my electron is sitting in this orbit and it moves to this orbit, then what will happen is it will radiate energy as a result because the energy here will be higher and the energy here will be lower. So E2 minus E1 will mean a certain amount of energy and that energy will all be quantized. E equals HF. The other thing that can happen is that the electrons can absorb energy, but again, the amount of energy that they absorb is an all or nothing thing. So let's say the energy is a particular amount that allows it to go to this particular orbit. But if the energy is slightly greater, but not great enough to get to this orbit, then the electron will stay in this orbit. So either it moves to this orbit, or it moves to this orbit, or it just moves to that orbit. It can't sit anywhere in between. And lastly, these electrons can change orbit by collisions. So in other words, going up or down through two collisions with other atoms. And here is where Niels Bohr had a great insight. Remembering 
Rydberg's formula, which it is sitting up here, he was able to explain why the emission lines or absorption lines of hydrogen are the way they are. Now, initially, of course, we're going to be looking at the Balmer series, and the Balmer series are the hydrogen lines that can be calculated using this formula that therefore give us these lines in the visible part of the spectrum. And if you remember, the value for the N1 ends up being 2 in this case. So Niels Bohr said, well, I can explain why this is the case. It's because if atoms of hydrogen are absorbing energy and those electrons are jumping to higher energy levels, then those electrons can jump down back down to level 2 and release very discrete amounts of energy. That is, if it jumps from, let's say, N3 to N2, then of course, what you would get here is a wavelength that would correspond to the red part of the spectrum. If you would jump down from N4 to down N2, this would become 4 over here. This wavelength, therefore, would become smaller. And as a result, there you would get a higher frequency and then it would correspond to orange and so forth. That would explain why you get these lines. Now, you not only have these Barmer series, there are also hydrogen emission spectra and absorption spectra for the ultraviolet and the infrared series. And the ultraviolet series are referred to as the Lyman series, whereas the infrared series are called the Passion series. And what you, that means is, is that instead of the value 2 being the first value here, for the Lyman series, you get the N value being 1. For the Passion series, you get them dumping down to three. And if you did the calculations using Rydberg's formula, you would see that these values here would correspond to lines in the visible spectrum. These wavelengths here would correspond to lines in the ultraviolet section, and the passion would correspond to the infrared section. So now we slightly modify the formula. So here's our formula again, but what you notice now, instead of one and two, what we have is NF, which stands for final, and NI being the initial. And so if I have my electron moving, let's say, from this shell over here, that is N6, it moves down to N2, so my final is 2, my initial is 6, and the green would represent the wavelength that I would get in that calculation. And so using an understanding of spectral lines, Bohr was able to verify his postulates in terms of the model of the atom. So now we have a model of the atom that is far more robust than Rutherford's initial atom. And it introduces the whole idea of quantum mechanics because we have discrete energy values here. As I said to you, it could explain our spectral lines. Here's my light source. I'm not getting any lines. I'm getting all the colors of the rainbow. But of course, what is happening here within my gas, I have these atoms that are absorbing the light, absorbing the radiation, and the hydrogen atoms are, of course, are re-emitting certain wavelengths, and it's in a random direction, so they may go in a different direction, which means if you were to analyze it from over here, you would find these ones missing because these are a very specific value, HF. Similarly speaking, if the energy is within the gas cloud over here, the only energy you would get out is what is being actually emitted by my hydrogen gas. And again, that would correspond to the wavelengths due to the electrons jumping down various energy levels. So here we have supporting evidence for Niels Bohr's work. However, Bohr's model does have some problems, and we're going to look at them. The first thing is that the theory that he devised was actually a mixture of classical and quantum physics. And if you understand quantum physics, quantum physics supersedes 
classical physics. In other words, our understanding of quantum ph physics explains everything we already know in terms of the classical sense. And so by incorporating some classical understanding, it wasn't necessarily a valid way of looking at the model of the atom. Secondly, the model could not explain various intensities of spectral lines. You'll notice some, some lines are of different intensities. Bohr's model does not explain that. Thirdly, there are existence in some particular spectral lines, some hyperfine lines around them. And again, Bohr's model could not explain why those lines existed. Fourthly, the model could not explain atoms that were not hydrogen or other particular cases where there are more than one valency electron. And so here I have spectral lines for hydrogen, helium, lithium and oxygen. And Bohr's model only works with hydrogen. It does not work with understanding the helium, lithium, oxygen or any other element for that matter. And finally, there's an effect called the Zeeman effect. If you were to place your material, your gas, under a magnetic field, well, what's observed is a splitting of the line. So here I have a single line that represents, in this case, an emission line. And when placed under a magnetic field, that line splits into three. That's called the Zeeman effect. But again, Bohr's model cannot explain why that occurs. But as I've stated to you before, Bohr's model is a vast improvement on Rutherford's model, and it is the, really the beginning of our quantum mechanics understanding of the atom. I hope that's helped you understand Bohr a little bit better. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.